wonderful things that have happened during these days, right? You know, you don't have to go somewhere and stay a week. This is what we found out. If you pray and concentrate, the people can come in the shortest possible time. And if you pack in a lot, they can get a lot. A lot of times, you know, I've gone to places and I've stayed a whole week and didn't get anything, maybe till the last go-round. But these workshops have never been like that. People have gotten blessings no matter where they came or where they had to leave. And we want it always to be that way. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, turn please to John chapter 13. And verse 34. Jesus says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. <clears throat> this scripture always fascinated me, and I never understood just how it worked completely, and maybe I still don't, but I never understood the fullness and richness of it until I entered into deliverance. When God shaped me up through the years and made me know in churches that I had for many years were filled with love because I reasoned that if the pastor didn't love the people, how could they love? He's to be their example. He's to be their leader. He's to be the one who sets the pace. If you find a cold and reserved church, you'll find a cold and reserved pastor leading that group. If you find a warm and outgrowing leader, you'll find the people develop that way if they stay with him. <clears throat> and Jesus said, you're supposed to love one another as I have loved you. Now, how did he love? How did he love? He pulled out all the stops. There was no reservation in his love. There have been a lot of times in this See, it's taken a long time to learn a lot of these things. I'm a slow learner, I guess. All of us are. But you see, when you follow Jesus, the thing you must learn to do is to give yourself. Until you do that, I don't care if you can preach like an angel. People will say, it wasn't that wonderful, but they won't do anything. I don't care if you can pray and seemingly ring the bells of heaven. If you're not filled with love, that love chapter means something, people. 1 Corinthians 13 is not just in there to make a nice, lovely statement on love. It really, it's really true. If you do all these wonderful things, if you build buildings, if you build magnificent works, if you collect huge crowds, if you generate unbelievable enthusiasm among the people, but you do not have the love of Jesus motivating, leading, and overshadowing you. You're nothing. You're wiped out. Zilch. And you see the world, the devil knows this. So he's come up with soulish enthusiasm. He's come up with soulish success. He's come up with earthly, sensual, and demonic wisdom to replace the true wisdom of God. And he has caused people to believe that if they can polyparrot Bible verses, they are spiritual. Now it's good to memorize scripture. It certainly is. And it's very dangerous to the devil if you do it. But I have occasionally met people who were like a walking Bible in that they could quote the scripture, but they had no real vital relationship with the author. And it was just like so much pretty poetry. When they quoted it, it thrilled me because I knew the author. When they quoted it, it wasn't the same. It wasn't the same. They tell the story, it's an old, old story, but it illustrates the point about a, an actor, a very gifted actor who could just emote on the stage. And he did monologues and poems and things that just moved audiences tremendously. He had a tremendous ability. 
and you know, somebody requested one time in one of his uh, plays that he read the 23rd Psalm and he did this with great moving things and, and, and when he finished the people broke, broke into wild applause they were moved by his rendition of the 23rd Psalm and a little old gray headed man stood up and said sir would you let me read that please would you mind and he said no come on up the little old man got up in a very quavering voice and with tears streaming down his face he read through the 20, well he didn't read it, he knew it, he just said it. With tears streaming down his eyes, he poured out his heart in the 23rd Psalm. When he got through, people were sobbing all over the congregation. There was no clapping. A holy hush had gripped the audience. And after a while, everybody was sitting there, you know, and people were weeping. And they were moved, but it was different. And somebody said, what was the difference? The actor was standing over to one side and he was weeping. He stepped up and he said, friends, I knew the psalm. He knows the shepherd. There are a lot of people who know the psalm. But some of them are not vitally connected with the shepherd. And their rendition will produce great waves of enthusiastic Fellowship, but not discipleship. They can generate enthusiasm. They can raise a million dollars in two nights. They can cast a spell on people, literally. And they'll go down and borrow money on their houses and cars and bring this money and give it to this person who already has millions in the bank. And this is actually happening. There is a man traveling the country. <laughs> I better not put it on tape. But I'll tell you who it is. If you come and ask me. <laughs> He's traveling the country. He's a marvelous fundraiser. It's a wonder somebody hadn't hired him. Or maybe they have. <laughs> Oh, listen, people. It's so important for us to understand the keystone of everything that Jesus is doing in this world. Everything that he did when he walked on the earth was motivated by a deep and a moving love and a compassion. Often the Bible remarks he had compassion on the multitude. He saw the people scattered as sheep having no shepherd and his heart was moved with, he was moved with compassion. Now, I haven't looked it up but I have a, uh, a worldly definition of compassion. I believe that compassion is love that loves so much it has to try to do something to alleviate the situation. It cannot just pass it by. You cannot have the compassion of Jesus. The devil has a counterfeit. We call it the do-good spirit. And they're doing good and they run, run, run doing good and they don't do any good. They drain themselves, drain their resources. They end up frustrated, angry, and wondering why, why when I did all these nice things, why is all the world falling in on me? Well, because it has to be motivated, driven by the love of Jesus. It's all in the name of Jesus. All in the name of Jesus. And through him, we have this. He says you must love one another as I've loved you. How did he love them? He loved them freely. He loved them like they were. Did you know that in deliverance it's especially important that you communicate to that person the genuine thing that you love them just like they are. They have tried to change. They can't. 
They've broken their hearts, many of them, trying to repent. They have spent hours at the altar. They've wept. They've cried. They've prayed through. They've done everything else. They've had their ears counseled off by psychiatrists for crying out loud, don't counsel them. I mean, I think some of the people who've come here, if every time a psychiatrist had counseled them, their ear had swelled, their ears had been hanging down below their belt. Or some lovely pastor who was trained in pastoral counseling. You heard Mary Lou say a while ago, pastor doesn't tell us anything. <laughs> I believe that people must be taught to get their final answers from God. Now, if the scripture says yea and the scripture says nay, fine. But there are a lot of things the scripture doesn't say yea nor nay. There are principles. And we must try to help people see the scripture principles. But we must not bind them. That's a mistake. You know, everybody likes to be led. Nobody likes to be pushed. The minute you push, somebody's going to say, oh, you push me, I'll push back. We've got to somehow let God arrange our lives and our attitudes so that people will know that we are trying to lead them gently. Now when they balk, you're going to have to let the rain drop. Just drop the rain, don't pull. You must try to persuade them. One of the best ways is to persuade them is for you to walk and show them. I have a little poem somewhere that says, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. Because if I listen to you, your tongue may go too fast, but I'll never miss how you are. You say, well, that's too hard, I know. That's why Jesus wants it that way. Because he wants us you know, did you know that Jesus didn't practice what he preached? You know, you hear this, practice what you preach, practice what you preach. He preached what he practiced. He did it, and then he preached about it. And that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to learn how to do these things, and then we can show others. And even when we move imperfectly in the things of God, it's absolutely unreal the glorious things that he will do with it. If you just move toward the Bible principles of God, he can do so much with that. You may not be theologically accurate enough to satisfy a seminarian, but if you are moving in the principles of God, he can do wonders with that. You are the best Christian somebody knows. You're the only Bible they ever read. You're the only preacher they ever listen to. You say, huh, I'm not a preacher. Yes, you are. Preacher, the word preach is the Greek word keruso, which means to proclaim. And that's what you're doing every day. You're proclaiming. You say, I don't want them looking at me. Well, they are. And you'll, you'll find yourself getting resentful about it. Well, don't look at me. After all, I have a right. <laughs> right? Hmm? We all get <laughs> like that, no? You ever get the yink yink? Get off my back. Don't be looking at me all the time. It's not fair. I have right to be ugly if I want to. Can't be nice all the time. <laughs> oh, we find that old straining within us, you know. It's not fair. Well, you can always throw a pity party. That'll help you. The sink lower. Won't get you out of the depths. Or, you want to get out of the you want to get out of the dumps when you're in the dumps? Anybody ever been in the dumps? You look like you have, somebody. <laughs> you know, you get down in the dumps, you get blue, everything can't remember a blessing. Yeah, I'm saved. Isn't that great? <laughs> Going to heaven. Hmm. 
But the nasty now and now is a mess. Pie in the sky by and by. But I'm living in the nasty now and now. What have you done lately, Lord? Besides so giving me my breath, my clothing, my house, my... Well, you don't go into all that, do you? You'd have to have a praise session with the Lord. Start thanking the Lord. You say, I don't have anything to thank him for. <coughs> you don't. You're breathing. Some folks are not. <laughs> That's blessing number one. You can see. Some people can't see. You say, well, I don't like what I see. Well, close your eyes. <laughs> you can hear. You can walk. You can move around. Amen. You've got enough energy to complain. <coughs> You're not lying in a coma somewhere. I mean, now, honestly, wouldn't you rather be here than any jail in the country? Amen. Or any hospital? See, so you got blessings you hadn't counted yet. Look around. You'll be surprised at the multitude of blessings that you have. Now, if you start counting your blessings, you'll walk your way right out of that pit you're in. Have a thank you session with the Lord. That'll help you. We're well, going to have to have his love to do this. He said, by this, by all men, this shall all men know that you're my disciples when you have reached all your goals and the buses are lined up bumper to bumper outside with all these dear people pouring in and filling the buildings. And the newspapers come in and write you up for being the greatest of all. By this shall all men know when they pick up the paper, wow, look at that church. Isn't that nice? Somebody won a trip to camp because they packed the pew. When will we ever get back to where Jesus taught us to walk? What's it going to take for us to understand that God's not interested in religious party role? God wants people who love. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If you cut your hair a certain way and dress a certain way, there's a certain group in this area. And you can spot them in restaurants everywhere. It's not the nuns and the priests either. You can spot those too. But this is a very religious group, a very Bible oriented group. But they all look alike. <laughs> You walk into a restaurant full of people and you say, oh, they're from so-and-so. And you listen in on the table, sure enough, that's right. They're preachers and workers from this particular group. They have a look about them. Now you stir up Hegwish and they're such a hodgepodge, nobody could pick us out. Amen. We could infiltrate the enemy and they'd never know we were there. <laughs> Now, what I'm saying is there are religious spirits that make you look alike, make you talk alike. One of the best things that's ever been said about the young preacher boys here is that none of them is a carbon copy of Wynn Worley. Thank God. If they become carbon copies of me, they would, I would have failed. Do you know that? That's no compliment to a preacher. When the young preachers pick up all of his inflections, now they better have their teaching right. <laughs> Undoubtedly, their thinking has influenced. And if you notice, the boys who spoke on this program, they were lacing in scripture, scripture, scripture. I watched with great delight. You know why? Because they know the main thing is the scripture, that that will do the work. The word does the work. And I count that as a compliment. They've learned that. But they are each individuals. I don't want them to be poured into Win Worley's mouth. Learn from me if I know anything that the Lord has given, yes. But to be carbon copies is no compliment. That's why we try to teach principles and not checklist. 
if you learn Bible principles, they will fit wherever you are. And you learn to go to the Word of God to find your final answers. Jesus said, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one for another. This is the great sign. And how many churches have you been in lately where this was the sign? Think about it. How many convocations do you go to, groups of people, who have genuine love? And I'm not talking about sloppy agape. I'm talking about the real thing. Where there's a genuine concern for the believers. Where there's a servant's heart. As the song said, where there's someone to care. Do you realize this world is dying because people don't care? Do you realize people are toughing it out and they're trying to do and they're trying to repent, they're trying to shape up, they're trying to dedicate, they're trying to uh, surrender. They've done all of these things and yet they're unfulfilled and they're reaching out for the love of Jesus and they haven't found it. You know, I realized a long time ago that I was not a great preacher and probably never would be one. I saw some guys who could really preach. I still see them and hear them. I don't admire them as much as I used to. When I was younger, I thought, boy, that'd be great if I could preach like that guy, you know. But I, I realized that I had a great many limitations that others didn't have. I wasn't very smart. I mean, they get up and they, they get in Greek class and they just loved it and I nearly threw up. Made me sick. All those Greek verbs. Who wants to spend hours memorizing those dumb things? I think that's nice for those who do it. But please, put me on the back burner. I'll take Mr. Strong any day. And I, uh, and they would, they'd fix these pretty sermons, you know. See, I've had homiletics. You'd never know it, but I have. Uh, I know how to prepare a sermon. I just don't do it that way. Uh, I mean, I know all the mechanics, and I have nothing against it. And I, when I hear somebody speak on the radio, TV, or in person, I can tell if they know homiletics. I can tell if they're going by the laws of her hermeneutics. I'm educated. <laughs> but you know, the funny thing is, the Lord... I learned all those things after, you know, the Lord kept me from getting exposed to that stuff until he'd already ruined me. You know how he ruined me? When I was a young preacher, going out to a church on weekends from college, and I always had a pastorate, and people couldn't figure that out, because I really wasn't that good a preacher, see? They were real fireballs, and I was just a old slow horse, you know, just ploddy plod. And um, they served angel food and gourmet tidbits and shish kebab. And here I had cornbread and turnip greens laid out, you know, and the people just, and I had the churches and they didn't. They had all their tidbits on the side and nobody to serve them to. And I was just, people were just calling for more cornbread and turnip greens. Now you folks are not from the South, you don't understand that. But that's food that'll stick to your ribs. Now, Thank you, Southerners. I appreciate that. <laughs> My humor is lost up here many times. Uh, it's like I talk in an unknown tongue sometimes. I, <laughs> you have to know how my people love me because they put up with me and they have the ghost of notion what I'm talking about when I go back south for my illustrations. But uh, I just had, I didn't have the juicy things to feed the people. But you know, I would get in my, I'd go out on weekends, and I always went fishing. You know, Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of men. I never had much time to sit around the pond trying to feed some reluctant fish, but uh, I did find a real thrill in going fishing like the Bible said. And if I couldn't find anybody, I'd go out and drive up and down the highway and pick up hitchhikers. And I used to get four and five a weekend. 
I mean, I just went out and hunted them. And uh, praise the Lord. We just have a, I just had a good time leading people to the Lord. I didn't have anything else to do. And um, then I'd get home and, and I'd get to bed by midnight. I always try to get to bed by midnight, one, two, three o'clock. I think I went to bed at 4.30 this morning. I got, finally got everything done. And uh, the, these old models can get along on less sleep than the younger, more delicate type. <laughs> but uh, the, I used to go to my room at, late at night, and it would be Sunday morning, 1 o'clock in the morning, and I'd start reading the Bible. And I'd just get engrossed in it, you know, just this, everybody was asleep. And I was on the lake, and I was lying in bed reading the Bible. I'd read the Bible. And it would just start coming off the page at me. Uh, I don't know how else to explain it. It would just start coming coming at me, you know. And I'd just get so excited. And here I am, a Baptist now. Very fundamental, proper Baptist. And I got to feeling Pentecostal. I could hardly <laughs> handle what was happening, you know. And I'd read, and I'd get more excited and more excited, and I think, and I'd finally, I just, I just say, oh, uh, uh, that's enough, Lord. I, I can't stand anymore. Yeah, I was just about to explode. I wanted to holler. Everybody was asleep, but me. And and I just, it just kept building up in me, and build, and I'd see so much on. I'd start studying for a sermon, see, and I was going to, I said, well, I'm going to cover this chapter. This is a good one, and I'd be studying, studying, and I'd get down to about five. By the time I got halfway through, I thought, oh, oh, there's more than I can ever preach. And, oh, I never get through preaching that much. I've been not reading more. That's just too much. I mean, the word was just coming at me like a like a express train. And you see, I thought that happened to everybody took me years before I found out that didn't happen to everybody. I thought that's what happened to everybody. I thought every preacher, when they sat down to read the Bible, that's what happens, you know. And uh, and I'd just sit there and I'd try to hold it down, you know, and, and I'd find out, I'd jump out of bed and get dressed, and I'd run out the, slip out the side door, and we were out in the country on a highway, moonlight night in August in East Texas, and I'd get out on the highway, and then I would run. I was so full of energy, I couldn't stand it. And I had to do something to get it off. And I'd just run down the highway and, and scare all the dogs. <laughs> Sometimes the dogs would come out, whoop, 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 you know. And, you know, and, and I'd, I'd run until I got way about a half a mile from anybody's house. And then I'd look up at the moon and I'd think about what I'd read. And I'd just throw up my hands and just holler and just holler and just holler. I wouldn't say anything. I'd just holler. I had to let it out. I was about to blow up. And I didn't know what all that was. But you see, what I'm saying is, God can do it. Now, all this happened to me, so you can imagine that the homiletics class was a little dull. You, I, I've got some sermons I prepared for my classes, and I got pretty good grades on them. I learned how they wanted to fix them, and I fixed them. I could never preach them that way, but I mean, you know, that's what they wanted, so I... I've turned in the outlines, you know, and they said, oh, that's nice. And I thought, yes, it is, but it won't preach, but that's all right. You know, it, somebody else can preach that, that because I just can't, when, when I'm talking about the Word of God, it just starts swelling up in me and it just flows over. And did you know, that can happen to you. It happened to me. You know why it happened to me? Because as a baby Christian over in China, I was in the army. And I had a buddy who became my prayer partner. And I'd never had a prayer partner before. I'd never even had a Christian buddy in service before. I just got saved not long before I went to the service. And we started praying and reading the Bible together. And that boy could sit down. And when he read the Bible, he, he just broke it up like Jesus broke the loaves and fishes. And it just multiplied right under your eyes. You, you, you know, you couldn't believe it. And I, and I thought, oh. Oh, Lord, I'd give anything if I could read the script. Now, after he did it, I could see it. And every time I read it, I'd, I'd, it'd all come back. What Paul had shown me. His name was Paul. He was a real Paul to me. Little bitty fellow, quiet. Unassuming, you'd never guess how much dynamite was hidden in there. 
And I don't know whatever happened to him, but boy, is he ever drawing re residuals. Because he pushed me off in the right direction. I don't even know where he is. I want to find him one of these days. Hug his neck. Because I don't know whatever, whatever he did for the Lord, but he sure hung me onto the scripture. I fell in love with God's word. I already liked it. But when he got a hold of me, I fell in love with the word of God. And I said, oh, Lord, I'd give anything if I could read and understand the scriptures like Paul does. The Lord said, anything? <laughs> oh, yes, yes. I didn't know what anything was, believe me. <laughs> and the Lord said, are you sure? Yes, Lord. Oh, yes, I'd rather have that than anything. Anything? And then the Lord started saying, how about so-and-so? Ugh. And he started subtracting. I said, I thought you said anything. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And he shaped up my life because I had such a hunger and a desire to be able to read the scriptures and understand them as this boy did. And you know, I got what I wanted. Delight thyself in the Lord and he will give thee the desire of thine heart. I've never pastored a church in my whole 34 years where people didn't begin to hunger and thirst after the word of God. God gave me that hunger and thirst and it communicates to every person that I minister with. People don't come to this church long until they're toting the Bible. They don't come here long until they're digging themselves. They don't even wait for the pastor to get over there. They're over there reading themselves. They get interested. They get hung into the Bible. Isn't that the way it ought to be? Amen. And all the principles that are in this book. And I, you know, I found out so many strange things. I found out that the denominations didn't call me when I was called to preach. People called me for a long time. They said, oh, you're going to preach. And it made it so hard for me. To if you see a young man you think is going to preach for crying out loud, don't tell him. You'll just make it hard for him. Did you know that? Shut your big flappy mouth. If God showed you he's called to preach, that's because he wanted you to pray for him. Not because he were not, hey, the Lord told me you're going to preach. He said, huh? And then, then he'll wonder, is it God or is it these dear people that I love? It took me two years to find out for sure whether I was called to preach because well-meaning people swarmed all over me and they were right. Listen, if anybody was ever called to preach, it was me. You would not believe how I've tried to wiggle off the hook several times. I tried my best to get the Lord to withdraw that and, and uh, you know, renounce his claim and everything. I remember one time, oh, I felt so sorry for myself. I was having a pity party and uh, I was wounded. And that was for other people's transgressions. <laughs> And you know, I said, Lord, if you just let me go, I'll dig ditches the rest of my life if you just won't make me preach anymore. Because if I preach, I love the people. If I love the people, they'll hurt me. I can't preach and not love them. See, he messed me up. <laughs> See, he, 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 jumped, he had his word jump all over me. And when his word gets all over you, then you start loving the people that you minister to. And when you love them, they can hurt the daylights out of you. And you say, well, I'm not going to let them hurt me. You never were around a preacher like that, were you? Don't touch me. I know one up in New York that says, please don't touch me before the service. I don't want your troubles. I have the anointing. I don't want it messed up. If I were you, I wouldn't touch anybody like that. I would want to get what he's got. <laughs> and it may be contagious. Then you have others, you know, that they say, Oh, I feel the anointing. It's all over me. It's all over me. <laughs> Boy, get some distance between you and them, too. That might splash off on you. You don't want what he's got. It's kind of like a disease. Religious spirits. 
But you see, I found out by experience what Jesus told that Samaritan woman. He said, what I give you will be like a well of water bubbling up from within you and pouring out. I used to read the Bible and read the Bible and read the Bible and then I, and I'd get up to preach and I'd, I'd be so excited because I had no idea what was coming out. And sometimes I would listen and I thought, wow, that sure is good. I didn't see that before because the, the spring was bubbling. If you let the spring bubble, it'll come up. God doesn't need any help. Did you know that? He needs us to get out of the way. Don't clutter the place up. But when you love, you minister love, you pour out an awful lot of love, and at first it seems like you're just pouring it out for nothing. And you go through dry seasons and people will turn their back on you. They'll be ugly and talk ugly to you and everything else. But you know something? If you keep on pouring out, it'll start, there comes a day when the returns start coming back. See, I've lived long enough to have the returns start coming back. I've been here, I guess this is 20th year or something like that, in Chicago. I didn't want to come to Chicago. The Lord and I had a terrible argument about that. And as usual, he won. See, he, he, he doesn't fight fair. You know, if he tells you to do something and you don't want to do it, he says, all right. You go the way you want to, but you'll have to go without me. Well, now, if you know anything, you know that's a bad way to go. He said, I won't make you go, but if you go your way, <laughs> don't count on me. I'll be waiting. Well, anyway, I came up here, and there were years when it just seemed like it was just an endless thing, and nothing really was happening. Brother that testified earlier said something about sowing the seed. And it gets discouraging. And the thing you want to do, you know, is dig up the seed every once in a while and see if it, what's the matter down there. You know, I planted this stuff, and you dig, and there's nothing showing, and so you dig it up and look, and say, oh, there, oh. You know what that'll do? That'll kill the seed. You got to plant it by faith and let it lay, right? And some seeds take longer to germinate than others. And some seem to take forever. What I want you to see, though, is that it will come up. I'm right now enjoying the blessing of having people whom the Lord used me to help and to help get started moving in the Word and help start loving and help start giving. They have begun to give back to me with such a tremendous backwash that I can't hardly stand it sometimes. I sit in the office and cry sometimes when I think I think of the mess Alice was what a mess you were Alice when you came bless the Lord if you've been saved out as much hell as that woman you'd cry every time you thought about it too she lived in hell literally bless her heart and I could pick out all over this congregation people whose lives were wrecked and ruined the devil had done a job on them But you know what they responded to? Love. Somebody cared about them. And I gathered a little group around me. And they caught, they began to catch on. And I know when we started in deliverance, I was so excited. What an exciting thing. This is what I've been cut out for. This is what I've been waiting for all these years. And I just took to it like duck to water. I mean, I didn't even have to learn to swim. I just went paddling across there. Isn't this great? <laughs> and one day, one of the men who was here then, who was in the beginning, he was with me, and he, he took me by the arm over to his house one time, and tears filled his eyes, and he looked at me, and he said, when? He said, you're really enjoying this, aren't you? I said, well, sure, isn't it great? 
And he said, when? We're all scared to death. We don't know nothing. We're just, I, we're just hanging on your coattail. <laughs> I said, really? It never dawned on me. But you know, that, that, that changed. Because soon they began to know. But you've got to have somebody who hadn't got any sense. <laughs> because if they got sense, they can figure it out. Now, nobody would get into that. Nobody would do that. You need somebody like Marcus Haggard. <laughs> who rushes in where angels fear to tread. <laughs> and takes his Bible hatchet and just chops down everything inside. Uh, but you need somebody who doesn't care about anything except the Lord. And the reason I'm saying this is because you can be that person back where you are. But don't expect it to produce instant results. You're going to have to pour out and pour out. And, and you may think you're well nigh perfect. You're not, only I am. But, but there's a lot of rough spots in all of us. And God uses many things in our lives to rub the burrs off of us. And oh, that's painful. Terribly painful. But in the end, it will work. You can break demonic walls everywhere with love. In Annihilating 2, I dealt with a technique that just developed and it's being used with telling effect on the devil across the country thank God I know when I was writing the book my assistant pastor Mike said when pastor well you've got to write this thing down about breaking walls said we know about it and everything we understand it here but said the people don't know about it and it's so vital they know and I said yeah I guess you're right and so we began to write it down so that others could just follow the, the suggestions and move into it and hang loose with the Lord and adapt it and they could use it themselves. And a pastor in Dallas the other day told me that it had revolutionized his congregation and it revolutionized the group of preachers they worked with and it was just, it was unbelievable what was happening with break, using this technique of breaking walls. Now, I started out, of course, my, uh, I always set my sights on the big ugly men because the Bible said they're supposed to shoulder the load and nearly everywhere you go they're sitting home watching TV or newspapers while mama prays and reads the Bible and comes to church and brings and drags kids in. Well that's backwards the way that God wants it to be. So I decided the thing for me to do is get the big ugly men lined up and make it easy for the wife and the kids to fill their places. And so I set my sights on these big ugly men when we got into deliverance I found guys that were all, all bound up uh, when, uh, of course, around here, you know, we threw away the handshake a long time ago, and, and uh, we used to over there, and people would walk in, and these big, tough guys come walking in, you know, and if the Lord told me to go up there and hug them, I would. I'd just say, hi, I love you, and i just pull, and, and boy, it's like hugging a chair. They just went like rigor mortis, you know. What kind of a thing have I walked into, you know? And, uh, but you know, the funny thing is, after about the second or third time they were there, there was something deep inside of them responding in spite of their macho image. And I noticed some of those big ones, big guys, they wouldn't be obvious, but, you know, this old gray fox learns a few things. You know, I notice things I don't talk about sometimes. And I noticed that some of these big, tough guys, after about the second, third time they'd been there, they would deliberately, they'd watch where I was walking or something, and they'd deliberately get in my path because they knew I'd stop and hug them when I came by. And I'd start, I, I, I'd watch them and I, out of the corner of my eye and I'd start moving and that guy would make a break and get over there to that aisle. <laughs> he, couldn't, he couldn't let on that he wanted me to hug him, but he did. And I found out well, one of the young men here, uh, when he first came, he had some demons that hated me so badly. Now, no demon likes me particularly, but some of them have a virulent hatred for me. And the one, there's, there's a kingpin in him that really hated the ground I walked on. And he'd come up, and when he had hugged me, 
that demon would manifest. And he'd go, you know. And, you know, it's kind of an odd situation. <laughs> the boy wanted hugging. I wanted to hug him, but uh, the minute I touched him, the thing went wild. And we found out, though, that if he'd pray in tongues, that thing would have to stay down. And so when it start manifesting, I'd say, pray in tongues. And then he'd pray in tongues and have, you know. <laughs> but that was, the whole thing about that, you see, is there was some things inside that hungered for love and affection, but were not, were opposed to it. Now, the Lord, I don't even remember how it all came about, except we learned in deliverance that love will burn out demons when nothing else will work. Well, I found some of these big old guys. The next thing, the Lord showed me that a lot of them, their fathers had never shown them physical affection. Even, even in a family where the father was affectionate. Oh, of course, many men are not affectionate at all. They're just kind of cold. It comes, it's inherited, it's learned. Yes or no. And, uh, even, but even in families where there was a, uh, the father was affectionate, he might hug his daughters even when they're married. But when the boy grows up, as a little boy, when he gets up just, just a little fella, pretty soon the daddy doesn't hug him anymore. He pats him on the back. You're my big man. Men don't hug, men don't kiss. Now, they, they don't tell them that. But they learn it by watching. Men don't hug, men don't kiss. Uh, that's, ew, that's a no-no. That wouldn't be masculine, see. And that boy grows up, and inside he has a hunger and a real need, especially at stressful times in his life, for his father to hug him, to show him physical affection. It's something he needs. And his mother can be affectionate and loving. And that's great, and, and that helps, but that's not the same. His wife can't meet that need. But, you see, he's conditioned, no. Nope. So now he wants to be masculine above everything else because in our society, you learn that's the great thing and that, that's fine. But he wants this affection from his father. He's thrown into a, para, into a pulling session, you see. And yet he can't afford to do that. So what he does, he builds a little wall up inside and he hides behind that wall so nobody will see that he really would like for his daddy to hug him. He can't afford to walk up and say that because his daddy kind of said, mm, you know, pushed him away. Oh, that's a no-no. Well, he grows up and then he builds that wall higher and higher. And he gets to where you can't tell how he feels. Because men don't cry either when they hurt. That, that's a no-no too. That's weak, that's sissy. And oh my, sissy, that's about the word. That's just as bad, as low as you can get, you know, sissy. So he's not allowed to cry, you see, because uh, so he has to go behind that wall and cry inside. But by the time he gets in his early teens, he's big boy. You can, you can hit him pretty good lick unless he wants you to know it. You can't tell whether you hurt him or not. Huh. He may be crying inside, but you never know it. Because he's conditioned himself, you see. He's built a wall to keep everybody out. And he looks and he says, now I'm all right. Nobody can really shake me up. Then he makes a dreadful discovery. He's built a prison cell that has no door. He's locked inside. And he meets people that he wants to form a close relationship to. Men and women. And he reaches out to them and bang, he hits that wall. He can only get so close. And then, they reach toward him the same way in friendship, love. They hit the wall. And he's frustrated. What can he do? The walls are too strong. He can't break out. He can't talk to anybody about it. He doesn't even understand what it is himself. He just feels frustrated and annoyed. He doesn't know what's the matter with him. And then when he gets married, 
then he really has problems. Because here's the girl to whom he wants to give himself completely. That's why he married her. That's why he fell in love with her. And he wants to share everything with her. So he wants to open himself and, oh, this is going to be great. And so he marries this precious little girl he loves. And sure enough, he reaches out to her when they marry. Bang, he hits the wall. Oh, <clears throat> he can do and say all the right things. But there's something missing. It's not quite there. It's almost. Now, the woman reaches toward him the same way because she loves him. That's why she married him. They were going to share that. And she reaches toward him. She hits that stinking wall. Now, she picks this up in her spirit. Women sense things in their spirit. And in her spirit, she knows that for some reason, he's not letting go. There's a reserve there that she can't get past. Now, being a woman, if it was a man, he would accuse her. This woman thou gavest me. Hmm? Man's first response is to accuse the, somebody else. The woman, being a woman, she accuses herself. She says, what's the matter with me? What am I not doing that I should be? So she examines everything, and she thinks, hey, I'm doing everything I know to do. Well, get him. Who does he think he is? I'm giving everything to him, and he's holding back a little. Now, how come? That's not fair. That's not what we agreed on. We were supposed to flow. Well, he's frustrated and angry because he can't get through that stinking wall. He wants more than anything else. And she's wounded because she senses this and doesn't know quite what to do with it. So you got a strain on the marriage right away. Now, that wall was put up by a father, either on purpose, accidentally, or because he didn't have a father. The only person that can break that is another father. And this is where you come in. You can step in and spiritually adopt that boy to be his spiritual daddy. And if he'll accept that, Usually when this message goes forth, there are big old ugly, there are women nodding their head all over the congregation, and there are men looking, trying not to look like I'm hitting them in the, in the down deep where it hurts, but there'll usually be a bunch of men come up and say, you were talking about me this morning. And one reason I'm broaching it here is because we have enough people to handle it. <laughs> but... Uh, the thing that happens, these walls are up. They're high. They're very strong and very hard to breach. Only another father can do this. By stepping in the gap, you can love, give love to this fellow. Now, when you do, when you do you're just going to have to hug him. And at first, it'll be like hugging a chair because he's scared. And what I do, I just tell him, I love you, son. I accept you just like you are. Now, that's what they always wanted to hear from their dad. See, we daddies are terrible. Our sons never please us. They, they did well, but they should have done better. See? And the, and the kid wants to please his daddy. And so here's a daddy he can please. And you're breaking down that wall of fear and convincing him, I'm going to accept you right where you are. I'm proud of you. And you can be honestly proud of the guy because he's seeking help. Somebody who's seeking help, that's a laudable thing to realize he has a problem and to look for help. So all of this is sincere. It's not just a bunch of, of talk trying to, uh, you know, con somebody into something. This is all real. And when you do this, by the way, you'll feel agape love welling up in you for that fellow. 
And you can hug him, kiss him on the cheek, tell him you love him. And I usually tell him, I say, let me come through the wall, son. Let me come through. I can't get through if you block me. But I'll break that wall if you let me through. And pretty soon, he will begin, he, he, he begins to concentrate on doing that. And I'll, I'll encourage him, I'll say, do you love me? And Well, first of all, he has to start receiving the love that I'm giving him. Now, I can't explain to you how, how you know this, you'll just sense it in your spirit when he opens up and begins to take this like a sponge, a thirsty sponge. He begins to, instead of resisting this thing, he begins to say, oh, this is great, you know, and, and everything. And then he, he'll see, he's still timid. And you, I tell him, I say, do you love me? And he'll say, mm -hmm. he doesn't say anything. You know, that, that wouldn't be masculine. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, uh, well, tell me. I love you. Real quiet, and real quick, you know. I say, well, show me. And then he'll, he'll hug down on you, know, and start hugging. And if you can get him to loving you back, that wall will just go wham, it'll go down, and his love will flow out towards you and you to him. And what happens, you see, is all that pent up love that he had for his daddy will come pouring out like a torrent all over you. And this is the beautiful thing that happens. And usually, he'll start, I've had him just start hugging me and kissing me, and they say, I love you, Dad. I love you, Dad. I love you. He's not talking to me. He's talking to his own daddy, whom he loved so much and was never able to give this love. And here, I'm a substitute. I'm sitting in for Dad. I'm his spiritual daddy. And now he can finally love somebody, not be ashamed, not be afraid, not be afraid that he'd be rebuffed, but he can let it go. And this brings a tremendous release. Usually, he'll bawl like a baby. Even these big old boys that don't ever cry. Hadn't cried for years. Next thing you know, your shoulder's wet. I say, go ahead and bawl. Just bawl. Let it go. Who cares? I don't mind if you cry. Come on, Dad doesn't mind you crying. Come on. Men do cry when they hurt. You've been hurt a lot. Now, come on, cry. Let it go. Because they've got to get that hurt out of them. They've got to get that bitterness, that deep-seated isolation out of it. And when it's over, I'm telling you, it's different. The classic story on that is over in Nevada years ago. I'd worked on about two or three young married fellows that were there. And about the third night of the meeting, the, uh, one of them came in and, well, I, after the first night, I got a hold of him. And every night then, he'd come rushing in and he'd hunt me up and boy, he'd throw his hands around, arms around me and just hug me and hold me, you know. Hi, Dad, you know, he was, just, he was just rejoicing. He was enjoying this. One night he came in and his little wife and little baby or a couple of kids there standing there and he grabbed me and he just held on to me and he just held on to me and just held on to me and just laid his head on my shoulder, you know. And I looked over his wife and I grinned and I said, honey, aren't you jealous of uh, your husband hugging around on somebody else like this? He, she said, my lands, no. I said, he's better than he's ever been. I don't know what you did to him. Do some more. <laughs> <laughs> and usually, you see, when this, when this breaking through comes through, then I'll ask him, I said, I said, is your wife here? And usually she's there somewhere. And I said, well, now I want you to do something for me, son. Okay. I said, you go over there and hug mama. Just hug her and kiss her and tell you love her. Okay. So here he goes. He goes and finds a little wife. She's been anxiously waiting. She doesn't know what's going on over there, all that funny stuff going on. She doesn't understand. She just hopes her husband's going to get some help. And he goes over and he throws his arms around her and said, Honey, I love you. And he kisses her. Then she starts bawling. <laughs> you know why? Because she senses that for the first time, that wall is down. He's coming wide open. And what a blessing it is. Now, this, this same thing works with women and their mothers, and some girls or their fathers have had bad things. And when you're mixing the sexes, you gotta be careful, avoid all appearance of evil. Just be